Good morning, friends. Steve in Southern Illinois. It's another cold day down here. Got up into the 50s over the week, and so the snow is largely gone from the yard. But there's white stuff drifting, drifting down this morning. So I'm going to start right in here this morning because, um, yeah, uh, I wish I was in Florida. Let's start by diving into history today. It's 58 BC. Julius Caesar has just been appointed as the governor, governor of the Roman province of Cisalpine. Cis means across, uh, and the Cisalpine province spanned from northern Italy across the Alps into eastern France. It was populated by the Gauls, who were Celtic tribes that lived, also lived in what today is Belgium and France. They were fearsome warriors. In fact, uh, the Romans had been dealing with them for a long time, almost 300 years before. The Gauls had gotten together and sacked Rome. Uh, so they were not uh, the, the Romans had great respect for the Gauls. But German tribes had been migrating into the area of Europe where the Gauls had traditionally lived, and the Germans were even more warlike than the Gauls. <clears throat> so as a result, the Gauls that were living near this Roman province had started making alliances with the Romans, hoping for protections from the Germans, and other Gaelic tribes had started migrating to try to escape the Germans. Caesar had just finished a year as, the, as a consul, a Roman consul. That was the highest elected official, civilian official, in the Roman government. Consuls were important, but it took a lot of money to be a consul because you basically had to fund your own government um, during that year. And so consuls invariably ended their year of service deep in debt. Can you imagine <laughs> the President of the United States being required to go into debt for the privilege of being the President of the United States. But that's the way the Roman government worked during the Republic. Okay. To compensate the consuls, after their year as the consul, they would be appointed as a governor of a province. Now, governors invariably made money, or the consuls invariably lost money. The, the governors invariably made money because they were allowed to keep part of the taxes from the province, and they also got to keep profit from any warfare that occurred while they were governor of the province. Happy Sabbath to you, Caldwells. <sighs> Now, Caesar had just finished his year as, as consul, and he had been appointed governor of Cisalpine Gaul. And almost immediately, he received word that the Helvetii, one of the Gaelic tribes, was asking permission to migrate through Roman territory to get over to a part of France. There were only 200,000 of them. Now, having 200,000 warlike people enter your country is not a thing to be taken lightly. I mean, it's the equivalent of asking an enemy army to walk across the border unopposed. If they decide to stay, you're in big trouble. And then word came that the German tribe that, that they were trying to escape was following them. So now it's not only a Gallic tribe.
tribe that wants to come into Roman territory. There's a German tribe following them, trying to attack them. Caesar quickly expanded his army, refused the Gauls' uh, request to enter Roman territory, and um, promptly attacked. Within a year, he had defeated the migrating Helvetii, as well as their German procedures, the German pursuers. And this sent a ripple of fear, anger, uncertainty through all of the rest of the Gallic tribes in France and Belgium. And as the summer of 57 dawned, those other Gallic tribes mobilized, determined to punish the Romans for their treatment of the Helvetii, and push them back across the Alps, get them out of Gallic territory. It was, it was a difficult summer for Caesar and the Gauls. Caesar's forces were almost defeated several times, but their superior organization and training always won the day. And by the end of the summer, he had conquered the tribes that lived in central Belgium and eastern, uh, northern France, okay? But that's not the story. You see, Roman law gave the general, the governor, first rights to all war captives. He could choose to free them, he could choose to kill them, or he could sell them as slaves. And usually it ended up some combination of the three based on his financial needs, uh, political concerns, etc. This included not just the enemy soldiers, but the entire civilian population in a conquered area as well. The selling war captives as slaves was the quickest way for an ex-consul to reverse his financial losses and become wealthy. Now, we don't have records of how Caesar treated all of the war captives that year. What we do know is that he punished one Gaelic tribe in particular because they broke a truce. Uh, and he punished their betrayal by selling them all, men, women, and children, as slaves, all 53,000 people. This is the way Rome was built. Conduct a war, punish your opponents, and depopulate the territory by selling many or all of them as slaves. Most of the slaves were transported to Rome, where they then became the workers in the fields. Uh, they were trained as shopkeepers. They, they were derisively referred to as mancipia, the snatched. Mana was hand. So these were the people that were grabbed. They were the snatched because they were taken away from the enemy by force. The English word emancipation derives from this same word. It could literally be translated unsnatched. Okay. Another term that was used for the slaves was sevi, the saved. And this was used ironically, sarcastically. They had been saved by the general from death. In other words, he had graciously not killed them. Instead, he only sold them into slavery. Aren't you thankful? From that word, we get the words servant and service. Slaves were not officially people. They were possessions, bought and sold. You're familiar with that. But they were not allowed to have families in the Roman system, majority of the time. 
They had no past. They had no personhood. They had no future. They were just widgets in a machine. They could not appeal to the courts if they were abused or wronged. If they were called into court as a witness, they had to be tortured before their testimony was acceptable. Socially and legally, they did not exist as people. And by the time of Jesus, by the first AD, the first century AD, slaves accounted for 30 to 40 percent of the population of the Italian peninsula. And even out in the provinces, slaves could comprise up to 25 percent of the population of towns. There were a lot of slaves, not people, people. And they were not the only disenfranchised people in the empire. The conquered people in the provinces were only a step above them. They weren't granted Roman citizenships. They were not citizens of Rome. They were conquered people, and conquered people they would remain. They were people. Uh, they could possess property. They could have families. But they had none of the other legal rights of a Roman citizen. And they were subject to heavy taxation. At any time, a Roman could demand free labor from them or take away their family or their possessions and there was no recourse. They could not appeal to the courts. Then there were Roman citizens who had been exiled, who had been punished for crimes, um, who'd lost political war, political battles. Okay, They were demoted and most of their, their, uh, their legal rights were stripped from them as well. This was the reality of the Roman Empire. We talk about the Roman Empire as an ideal, the rule of law. Yes, it was a rule of law, but it was a world where privilege was flaunted and the disenfranchised were excluded and oppressed. Enter Jesus. Now, last week, we talked about my conclusion that having an evangelistic fervor does not mean that a Christian is hot. Being hot, on fire for Christ, is not what Revelation was speaking of when it was talking about Christians being hot, cold, and lukewarm. This week I want to focus your attention on the first of three thermometers that the Bible offers for measuring our spiritual, spiritual temperature. This one is found in John chapter 13, verse 35. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. Now this verse is so familiar that it's become invisible. Oh, yeah, love. But what about, and we launch off into issues of religious belief and practice. Stop, right there. Jesus says that this is the defining characteristic of his disciples. Love for each other. Love includes respect. Acknowledging that you and I share the same value of personhood. I am not worth more than you are. We are both humans. Love includes compassion feeling the pain of another person and taking action to relieve it or to share it. Love includes generosity, giving without judging, receiving without coveting. Paul spells this, this description of Christ's disciples out explicitly in, in Colossians chapter 3 verses 11 through 14. I'm going to th read it from the English Standard Version. Here there is not Greek or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all and in all. Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, 
humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another. And if one has a complaint against the other, forgiving each other. As the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. James drives the point home with a story. This is Steve's paraphrase. A rich man walks into church wearing a fine suit. He's followed by a man wearing a t-shirt and blue jeans that aren't so clean and they have a hole in the knee. Which person, asks James, are you going to ask to sit with you in church? Read it for yourself in James chapter 2, verses 1 through 9. Imagine what it would have meant within the context of the world Jesus lived in, a world filled with the dispossessed, the disenfranchised, the disempowered. When you entered a Christian gathering, there were no churches for the first 100, 200 years of the Christian church. You worshipped in people's homes. So when you entered a Christian's home for a Christian gathering and you sat down to break bread, to eat together, a rich man might wash a poor man's feet. A Roman might hand bread to a Jew. A free man might pass the wine to a slave. All were equal. There were no social divisions, no class distinctions, no anger and resentment over the discrimination and the oppression that existed outside the church, but disappeared within the community of Christians. The Gospels describe how the outcasts of Jewish society flocked to Jesus. Prostitutes, publicans, fishermen from Galilee, their equivalent of our rednecks here in America. The crude and the rude, the uneducated, or at least that's the way the educated people think of rednecks. I think rednecks have a different picture of themselves Jesus even included a militant religious zealot. We would call him a terrorist today. He was included in Jesus' 12 disciples. As the church expanded after Christ's death and resurrection, the disenfranchised in the greater Rome flocked in. Why? Because they found in Christianity, in the fellowship of the church, in the community of Christians, an answer, an antidote to the injustice and oppression that they had to endure outside of it. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, that you have love one to another. Now you have a slight inkling of the radical, subversive power that was the gospel. Yes, it focused on Jesus and his life and death. All of this was possible, because it was validated because of who he was and what he had done. But the gospel was manifested in the lives of Jesus' disciples in a way that we often forget about today. No wonder it generated such opposition in those days. But I ask you, who are the outcasts in your society, in your community? How many of them are included in your circle? The people that you accept, that you identify with, my people.
my brothers. How many of them have you invited to sit down with a meal with you? How many of them would find your church meaningful and welcoming to them? What is your temperature today? Be safe, friends. Be prudent, but above all, keep looking up. I look forward to seeing you next week and exploring another temperature, another thermometer for Laodiceans.